who's frequently described as a legend in the world of investing, an American who's moved thousands of miles around the world to act on his belief that the future belongs to Asia. Jim Rogers grew up in a small town in Alabama in the 1940s and 50s. The son of a manager at a chemical plant, he excelled in school and won scholarships at both Yale and Oxford. In the 1970s, he worked on Wall Street and co-founded the Quantum Fund with the billionaire philanthropist George Soros. It was an extraordinary success, gaining more than 4,000% between 1970 and 1980. But at just 37 years old, he left his job, choosing to travel the world instead. Now in his 70s, Jim combines work with his regular exercise routine and continues to be an active investor. Let me begin from the very start. You grew up in a home in Alabama in the 1940s and 50s. Paint a picture for us. What was life like growing up there with your family? Uh, very simple. Uh, it's amazing how little I knew about the world uh, back then. In those days, uh, the town was very small. My phone number was five. It was that kind of town. It was far away from any city. In the 40s and 50s, most, there wasn't that much news coverage anywhere. There were three television networks total in the country, in the U.S. Uh, there was radio. Uh, we didn't really, I listened to baseball, played baseball, did things that little boys in country towns did, but I didn't have much exposure to the outside world at all. For some reason, if you grow up in a place like that, you either stay and never leave, or you're burning up inside to see the world. Well, I was one of those who got this book that I wanted to see the world, as much of the world as possible. From when I, from when I was a teenager, I can remember talking about it. Fortunately, I got a, a scholarship to go to, uh, to, to Yale, which was uh, far, far away. It was a fancy American university, and that started exposing me to the world. Then I got the scholarship to go to Oxford, which was even further away. So I started seeing the world because of getting scholarships to go to fancy colleges. And then I could hitchhike around Europe, I could do other things to start seeing the world. Despite coming from a small place, you still managed to discover that you had a talent for investment and finance. How did you figure that out? Well, I didn't find that out there in that little town, no. Uh, and I didn't really know, I, when I was a senior at Yale, by, by chance I got a summer job on Wall Street where I knew nothing, I just liked the guy a lot. He said, come work here for the summer. So I did. Uh, I didn't know that there were differences in stocks and bonds. I didn't know anything about Wall Street except something bad happened in 1929. I didn't know what happened, but I knew it was bad. But I got there and I fell in love. I couldn't believe here there was a place because my passion all my life had been the world uh, and to know as much about the world as I could, even if it was only a small amount. And here was a place that would pay me and pay me a lot of money if I could do it right, if I could understand the world and f foresee the future of the world. And I couldn't believe it. So I stayed. And what was Wall Street like back in those days? It was very, it was very quiet, it was very calm. Uh, I can remember that a big day on Wall Street trading all day was three million shares. I mean, now that's, they trade three million shares in one minute before breakfast. It was a calm, quiet place, nothing like now. You also met George Soros there. What was your first encounter with him like? Uh, I think it was because he needed a, a young man and I needed a job. And somebody introduced us and we hit it off. What was it that made you guys decide to hit it out on your own? Well, that was fortuitous. They changed the law in Washington that said we couldn't, do, we couldn't manage funds in a brokerage firm. So we had to leave because the law changed. Uh, who knows if we would have eventually left on our own anyway, but we were forced to leave because they changed the law and off we went. There must have been some big challenges and perhaps some big doubts uh, going into business on, on your own. What, was, what were you thinking at the time? Well, I was thinking, I hope we survive. But no, I certainly took a huge pay cut when we started the company. I took a, it was a 75% pay cut uh, to start the company, which I didn't mind. I didn't need that. What was I going to do with the money anyway? Because I loved working all the time. So I didn't really need money. I didn't go off spending cars, vacations and stuff like that. So I didn't need it. So I didn't mind taking the pay cut. And, you know, we were sitting in a room. There were two, two partners, one secretary. 
some money over there in the corner and we had to do something to survive and so we did. You make it sound very easy but there must have been some tough times. Oh yeah, uh, I can remember in the first year we, we thought we'd lost everything as a matter of fact. I went to my university reunion, my Yale reunion, and I said, well, I'll be the first to go bankrupt in the class. Fortunately, we didn't. We saved the, the situation and wound up making a lot of money. But at first, we had, there was one period there where we really did very badly. You made gains of 4,200% over the course of uh, the 10 years that, that you worked uh, <laughs> together. Did you ever imagine that you would achieve that level of success? No, no, that's, uh, I, it's still inconceivable. <laughs> it's still remarkable that we did that. We did that. Uh, but it, it wasn't what I was thinking about. I was just thinking about I was loving what I was doing. Uh, he was loving what he was doing, and so we were just you know, doing it. Uh, I don't even know that it ever really sank into me until later. My God, 4,200% in 10 years. How do we do that? Uh, that was not the, the focus. The focus was more every day. What do we do now? At the age of 37, you decided to take another turn in life and leave that all behind. Why was that? I didn't want to wake up one day and still be sitting in front of a computer screen or something. I wanted to go around the world on my motorcycle. I rode through Central Europe behind the Iron Curtain. They let me do that uh, in the early 80s. But the concept of driving around the world was pretty alien because I wanted to go across Russia and China. It, to me, it wouldn't have counted otherwise. You know, sure, I could have gone around the world, but then I would have always said, you know, I didn't really do it. I did a, a imitation of going around the world. So I set out to get the Russians and the Chinese to let me drive around the world. Looking back on it, that was absurd. <laughs> you know, yeah. It was an American, a capitalist, going to the Soviet Union and say, I want to ride my motorcycle across Soviet Union. And the Chinese, the same thing. I, I went to China in 1984 asking permission, and th they were perplexed because they couldn't, why, why would you want to do it? Uh, and they said there are no roads, there are no petrol stations, there are no restaurants, there are no hotels. They were right. I eventually did it. They were right. It couldn't be done. And likewise, the Russians. The Russians said, why do you want to go to Siberia? There's nothing out there but forest and jungle, and it's, why would you want to do that? Uh, but eventually, they both came around, and they let me do it, and off I went. Ever since his first visit to China in the 1980s, Jim Rogers has been a long-term investor in the country, firmly believing that it will be the dominant economic force of the future. So much so that he and his wife Paige moved to Singapore in 2007 so that their daughters would grow up speaking Mandarin. After your travels, you decided to relocate to Singapore, of all places. Why was that? I wanted to make sure my daughter spoke Mandarin, and perfect Mandarin, and understood perfect Mandarin. So we realized that if I was serious, I was going to have to move to a Chinese-speaking city. We explored various uh, cities in China, but they were all very polluted, so we couldn't bring ourselves to move to China to lift, to, to breathe all that air. So Singapore seemed to be the perfect answer. In Singapore, they speak English and Mandarin. I don't speak Mandarin, so I thought it'd be very, very good a compromise. We tried Singapore a couple of times. Uh, we, we got into the right school, the best school we wanted to get into. It's worked out fine. It's great. Why was it so important for you that your daughters learnt Mandarin? Well, that's a good question. I had realized in the 80s that China was going to be the next great country in the world, and I would lecture and broadcast and write that everybody should teach their children and grandchildren Mandarin. Then I had one, uh, and I had this fixation that everybody's got to, I got to teach my children Mandarin. Uh, but I also realized I ran into so many people, especially Chinese, who kept saying to me, we didn't do it and we wish we had. And I realized that I really knew that China is going to be the next great country. That's clear to me. Uh, so it's important to me that she would have the tools. Well, you said that you know, people around the age of 8, 9, 10, and I believe your daughters are around that age, really refuse to speak a second language. What's it like with them? Are they quite happy to converse? Oh, no, no, no. They, they, no they, the reason to move to a Chinese-speaking city was they'd have to speak it. 
you know, you go into a shop, you got to speak Mandarin. It won't do you any good if you cannot. They speak perfect Mandarin. They don't, if you heard them on the te telephone, you would think they were Chinese. Uh, they, whenever they get in front of Chinese audiences, they gasp in the room because they're Mandarin. You know, I see these little blue-eyed girls walk up on the stage. They just, uh, then they start speaking, and they, I literally, they, they gasp in the audiences at how good their Mandarin is. Now, you were certainly right about uh, the growth that China's experienced, but what about the direction of the economy now? What are your main concerns? Well, America was the most successful country in the 20th century, but along the way, we had many setbacks. We had 15 depressions with a D. We had horrible civil war, very few human rights, little rule of law, massacres in the streets, and yet we did a pretty good job in the end. So China's going to have problems. Uh, I don't know what or when or why or how. Uh, every individual or family or company or country that rises has problems along the way, and China will too. Uh, they've got debt now. 20 years, 15 years ago, there was very little debt in China, even 10 years ago, very little debt in China. Now there's a lot of debt. They've learned about how to borrow money. Uh, there are going to be some problems. There will be bankruptcies. Anybody in China who deals with the West and has debt is going to have problems in the next uh, decade or the next few years. So there will be China problems in China. But in the end, I'm teaching my children Mandarin. I'm not going to stop learning Mandarin and speak Danish or something. So let's talk about India. You once said that India in 30 or 4 years time won't exist as, as we know. Do you still stand by that? Oh yeah, don't you? Uh, I mean, if you look at India, a map of India, that country did not exist uh, through most of history. Uh, the English pushed it all together in 1947 and said, okay, here you are, now you're India. Uh, there are many ethnic groups, religious groups, linguistic groups, etc., and they don't like each other, many of them. So I would suspect that the country would split up. But many countries are splitting up. It's nothing unusual about that. Czechoslovakia no longer exists. Yugoslavia no longer exists. Sudan no longer exists as we know it. Ethiopia no longer exists as we know it. So you're already seeing countries splitting up and more will come. What do you make of the current Indian government's moves to develop the economy? How do you think that's going to change the, the infrastructure of the economy? Well, you know, Mr. Modi came along and said a lot of good things and, and had indicated he had a good record before. But so far, I, he hasn't. It's been all mainly talk. He has apparently or is in the process of changing the tax situation with the GST. but. To me, it's been a disappointment. I bought India chairs because of him when he looked like he was going to win, but I sold them because he hasn't done anything. And the whole demonetization, I mean, that was just theft for, for a lot of people. And I don't see that it changed anything except made the government richer at the expense of the poor Indians. So I, I, I would like to be more positive. It's an astonishing place ethnically, linguistically. Uh, the food, I mean, it's just amazing. Walking down the street in India is a sensory feast. But, you know, the infrastructure is pretty hopeless. Only half of Indians stay in school till they're 12 years old. It just, yeah, it has not lived up to what it used to be. In 1980, India was much more successful than China. Well, you know the rest of the story. As a Westerner in Asia, what sort of advice would you give to people looking to find opportunities in this part of the world? Whatever you know and love, come here because you've got, you can do it and you can make a fortune. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's tablecloths or soap or electricity or finance, whatever it is, enormous opportunities in Asia now. And this is where a lot of the money is, a huge savings in, in uh, Asia. The foreign currency reserves at China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. You know, there's a lot of assets here. Uh, this is the place to be if you want to be successful. Uh, geopolitical tensions are perhaps a, a bigger theme in global investments now than they normally are. How do you think that's going to play out? How do you think that's going to uh, affect uh, investing in Asia? The Chinese have their rocks that are upsetting people. Uh, but I would suspect that the Middle East has worse tensions 
and as does parts of Europe. I mean, there are many people in Europe who want to split from their own country, who want to split from Europe, the EU, I think, that is. So lots of political considerations and tensions everywhere. I, I don't see a war in Asia anytime soon, but who knows? People have done strange things throughout history. This nationalistic uh, uh, movement by many leaders around the world uh, is going to impact um, protectionism, for instance. How do you navigate uh, around that? Well, throughout history, when uh, things have not been great, or when things have deteriorated, people, politicians, have appealed to anti-foreign sentiment. It's easy to blame the foreigners for your problems. They have different skin, different languages, different religions, different dress, different food. It's happening again because, you know, the debts have been going through the roof all over the world. The only way many people have been able to sustain anything, such as the U.S., is because they keep piling up higher and higher and higher debt. And it's very hard when you've got staggering debts to run very fast because you always have that debt over hanging over your shoulder. And it's happening all over the world. Most of the European nations are deeply in debt. And that's why you're starting to see this appeal to nationalism or chauvinism, whatever you want to call it. It's been the way the world has always worked. And unfortunately, we're now in a period like that again, and you're going to see more and more anti-foreign sentiment everywhere. Uh, we do hear a lot about your thoughts on investing in Asia, but as you bring up Europe and um, do you think that what's happening right now is going to cause uh, that region to, to stagnate in the, in the future? Oh, yes, yes, yes. If you look at the debts in the UK or, I mean, Italy, Germany even, even Germany has a lot of debt now. So, yes, and that's adding to the internal tensions and it's going to be worse as we go forward. And there are going to be more politicians who are going to make their or try to make their reputations by saying, let's split. Let's get rid of those people. Let's get rid of the foreigners. Let's get rid of the... In Brussels, the, you know, there are many people in Belgium who want to split Belgium into two countries. So it's going to be more and more tension like that for the foreseeable future. And some will succeed. The British did it. The British left uh, the e or are they in the process of leaving the EU. The Scots may try again to leave the UK. I mean, who knows what's going to happen next. Advances. After years of avoiding putting money into Russia, Jim Rogers is now a regular visitor and a big believer in its potential. He has a stake in the fertilizer company Foss Agro where he sits on the board and has also invested in the Moscow Stock Exchange and airline Aeroflot. Previate, previate, previate. All this at a time when relations between Russia and the West have come under strain over Ukraine and alleged attempts by Moscow to influence the American presidential election. Russia has become a sensitive topic uh, in the US for a number of reasons. Do you see that derailing the Trump administration? Uh, no, I don't because uh, Russia, uh, many countries are now becoming friendlier towards Russia. Uh, the Philippines, you know, they love it. whoever the next president of France is, probably is, or they say they're friendly towards Russia. They want to re-examine the whole Russian uh, relationship. Some of the Scandinavian countries have already re-established relationships. I mean, many of the European countries are not happy with the sanctions for good reasons. So no matter what happens in the U.S., I suspect that Russia will become more and more, you know, it's so hated that it's going to be less hated and things will get better, probably even in the U.S. as well. What do you make of uh, President Trump's um, policies on the economy? Which, which, which you, ones? He said, US he said he was going to, well, no, I, I, well, I'm, I'm saying when I say which ones, I mean, I don't know. He's got so many policies. He contradicts himself. He promised us repeatedly he's going to put 45% tariffs on China the first day. Mexico, he's going to have a trade war. I promise you the first day he's promised he was going to declare China a currency manipulator, et cetera, et cetera. So which policies? He hasn't done it. It's been there six weeks now. And he hasn't done any, many of the things he said he was going to do. I'm not sure Mr. Trump knows 
what his policies are or what they will be. He hired three people who were very keen on a trade war with China. They got very high positions. They were hired early. Now, I don't know if somebody has calmed them. I don't know what's happened. So I don't know what his... I do know that trade wars are disastrous for everybody, uh, including the innocent bystanders. Uh, so if that's what you mean, then it's, it's terrible for all of us. Some of his other policies that he says, he says he's going to cut taxes. That's always good for any economy, any society. He says he's going to rebuild infrastructure. Well, America desperately needs infrastructure. It's deteriorated dramatically in the past 50 years. You've um, been investing in, in Russia for several years now. Can you explain what your interest is in the country and, and what specific areas it is that, that excite you? I first went to Russia in 1966 and came away saying this will never work and felt that way for the next 45 or 50 years, uh, that it was just it was hopeless. No matter how many times I went or whatever I saw or driving across, I knew it wouldn't work. Um, then two or three years ago, I realized that something had changed in the Kremlin that they didn't just say, we're going to shoot you or take your money away or put you in jail or whatever. That and Who knows what happened, but there was a change in the Kremlin. And so I started uh, getting interested there. There are huge resources in Russia. There's not a lot of debt, like many other countries, because nobody would lend money to them, uh, rightly so. Uh, and, and vast resources, convertible currency, not much debt, uh, so there was everything there. Uh, so I and cheap and hated, definitely hated. Uh, so I started investing. I bought uh, Aeroflot. Uh, I bought uh, stock exchange. Moscow stock exchange is publicly traded, the home of Lenin, <laughs> Stalin. You know. Um, well, e I've, I've got. To, I've got to ask you because. You know, you've said in the past that uh, Russia has the potential to be an agricultural powerhouse. I'm assuming you've invested in agriculture in Russia, and how do you see that developing? Uh, my largest holding, or a large holding, is uh, Fosagro, which is a big fertilizer company. I'm a director as, a, as well. They made me a director of the company because I am optimistic about agriculture. And in Russia especially, the Russians have vast agricultural potential. It was ruined by the, by the communists, obviously. Uh, they totally ruined it. Agriculture is depressed everywhere in the world, uh, but especially in Russia because of what the communists did there. Uh, now agriculture is having a boom, partly because of sanctions. You know, the, the world said, we're not going to buy your stuff, so the, we're not going to sell you stuff. So the Russians had to make it themselves. So agriculture is having a boom uh, there, and there are people going back to the farm because of the opportunities there. So no, agriculture has got a, a great future in Russia. Chinese are starting to go, move into the Siberian part because there's vast potential there, and a lot of Chinese, and there's a lot of empty land up there in Siberia. So no, it's got to learn how to drive a tractor. Head to Russia or China, or well, Russia especially. You've been credited with spotting trends early as well. Are there any trends that you're currently not invested in that you'd like to be in? North Korea. You know, I'd see great things happening there, great changes. Um, but there's nothing I can do because uh, I'm an American citizen. People inevitably look to people like you for, yeah. for tips in investing. What advice would you give to them? My advice would be, do not take my advice, do not take anybody's advice. Uh, my advice, if you're going to be a successful investor, is invest only in what you yourself know a huge amount about. You obviously have uh, deep thoughts about uh, your, your daughters and, and where they'll head to in, in life next. Um, what sort of legacy would you like to leave behind? Well, my daughters are the most important. That's the legacy. Uh, you can ask me in 30 years whether I did it right or not, but uh, that's, that's all I really care about right now, these two little girls.